Good morning, everyone. I'm Megan Cullough, along here with Scott Micklin. Good morning. Look at that. Somebody's on it. Wow. If, even if I'm not. But yeah, yeah 57 weeks. Wow. Yeah. Week 57, everyone. Welcome 57. to our COVID-19 Community Information Program. We're glad that you're with us. And uh, we've got a great program today. As always. As always, right? I don't know how we do it week after week. 57, <laughs> 57 times. I don't know how we're doing it. But, anyway. uh, <laughs> but we do. Look at these great guests who are lined up to talk to us today, uh, beginning with... Farmington Mayor Nate Duckett, who I know is in the green room, physically, or theoretically speaking, right? The phone green room. <laughs> we have a green room? We do. I want some snacks. Yeah, we do. Um, also, we're going to be talking with uh, Allie Rye from the uh, Emergency Management Department, San Juan County, and Ty Tapaha from the Bridge, the City Living Center here in Farmington. So that's what that's what we have ahead. And also, you know, sharing all the other information, COVID-related information that we have been collecting over the last week. Yes. So, so there you go. Should we get started? Let's hop to it. Really? Yeah, I okay. think, I believe Mr. Mayor is ready for us. Uh, well, and we're ready for him. Yeah. So bring it, Mr. Mayor. No. <laughs> <laughs> Nate Duckett is on the phone with us this morning. Mr. Duckett, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, all. How are you all? We are well, thank you. Thanks for calling in this morning, and uh, we appreciate that because last week um, on the Thursday, we had just found out, of course, that San Juan County had uh, digressed from turquoise to yellow on the state's very colorful um, map. And uh, you were very vocal, I think, in your frustration about that happening. And you had written a letter to the state officials of, about kind of how they come up with these color coding. And that is why we wanted to talk to you, Mr. Mayor, to see, I guess, a couple questions here. One, um, talk to me a little bit about your letter. And B, have you gotten any response? Well, good morning. Thanks for having me this morning, Scott. One, um, the response I got from Dr. Scrace was a clarification of the vaccination numbers. That's the only communication that I've had with him uh, since releasing that last week. There was communication from the governor's office on Monday that vaccination percentages in one way, shape, or form would start being used soon um, for the gating criteria. Uh, but there's nothing, I haven't seen anything firm yet, I've not seen a new policy, I've not seen anything. So by soon, we don't know if that means by the release of the noon map this Wednesday, or soon meaning May. Right, you know, I'm a fairly optimistic guy, and I'm hoping that this next, my, my hope is that somehow that, that letter spurred some, you know, hey, let's get this done. We've been talking about it for months uh, on the mayor's council calls, these calls are coming from mayors across the state who are concerned about the same same things that I'm concerned about. It's the fact that less people are going to be getting tested as more people get vaccinated, um, and that's going to manipulate those numbers a little bit. So taking into account, you know, the, the high number of vaccinated individuals in our county, I think, has to come into play um, for the benefit of this community, all the communities in, in New Mexico. Right, and so let's dig into the positivity rate and the testing and the negative tests. So as <clears throat> is, is that criteria going to be completely wiped away? Because as people get vaccinated, I mean, we're hearing all sorts of conflicting reports. I know the schools aren't requiring their teachers to be tested anymore once they're vaccinated, but then that skews our positivity rate numbers as far as positive tests go. And so when you say they're going to take vaccination into account, are they going to wipe away the test part of the criteria and maybe just do cases at, per vaccine? Or do you know anything about that? You know, if I had that info, Megan, I, I would be a part of the DOH and be paid by the state. But unfortunately, they are not telling us anything, which has been the MO uh, through this whole process. I mean, quite literally until the governor comes on TV uh, or a Wednesday afternoon press release comes out, they, they literally leak no information um, that I'm aware of. So I've not gotten the full breadth of what that new update may be to the getting criteria, but I'm certainly anxious to find out. Understood. And so I, so I guess, Mayor Duckett, then um, what you're telling us is that you have information from Dr. Scrace and from some of the state officials that they are going to incorporate some additional criteria into this mapping system, but we just don't know exactly how that's going to work and when it's going to be 
used. Well stated. Exactly right. Okay. But as optimistic as you said you are, we are you are you are hopeful that it will be maybe sooner than later. Yes, sir. I mean that's certainly my, my hope. I hope that's uh, that's what they're working towards. And for the, the businesses, Mayor Duckett, I mean, again, and I think we hear this too from the Chambers of Commerce and, and things like that. I mean, it is, I, know, I know it's very difficult for businesses like restaurants and others to have to ramp up, ramp down, hire people, not hire people um, in, in this two-week um, time period that we have between these, the releases of this map information. And I imagine you're hearing a lot of this as well. Yeah, prior to this, you know, the drop back to yellow, you know, we had been four weeks where we had additional capacity in the restaurants. And what the restaurant owners specifically were dealing with was the fact that, you know, your DoorDash and Grubhubs were, I mean, th that traffic has grown dramatically. And so they're having to fill those orders. And then, of course, they have their regular customers who are doing dine-in, and they couldn't find enough people to, to fill their ranks. They couldn't get their workforce built up to satisfy the demand of the public. And so that was becoming... I was becoming an issue, and this is being echoed, you know, by a number of restaurants throughout town, including the need for cooks and dishwashers and waiters and hostesses, the whole the whole line. And so, then you get to you know you drop from turquoise to yellow, and what do you do with all those people you just hired? Um, now you've got to send them home, and it just creates a really you know I've used the term yo-yoing effect, um, and and unfortunately. You know, I kind of think, too, I've got a friend, an Española restaurant owner. You know, he ramps up, he buys a bunch of food, and then all of a sudden he has to shut down. What, is, what does he do with all that food? And it just be, it becomes, you know, we, we've got to look at this from a more realistic perspective. We're dealing with human beings. If we can't just be basing everything on numbers, my biggest concern about the gating criteria right now is there's no margin of error built into it. It has taken data that is clearly inaccurate, has been proven to be inaccurate when it comes to testing no false positives, false negatives, uh, the whole gambit, and the population numbers that they're using are stagnant. You know, they're using 97,000 people for San Juan County, these are individuals over the age of 16 that are part of that 97,000, but Scott, you and I both know, on a weekend here, this 45, 50,000 population in Farmington becomes 100,000. They can become 150,000, and on a daily basis, in my opinion, there's more than 97,000 people in this county, Albuquerque, Bernalillo County, it's the same thing. Bernalillo County has not come out of yellow yet. And that, you know, you speak to those business owners there, you speak to the Albuquerque Convention Center people, which I get an opportunity to speak to on occasion, and, and it's becoming overwhelmingly frustrating uh, because uh, when are we ever going to get out of this? When are we ever going to start being able to run our businesses and bring people back in? And, you know, you're trying to juxtapose this against other states that have chosen different strategies, but our state's is standing firm on this. And I, so that's what we're really trying to, to push to say you've got to change with the times as vaccinations are becoming more prevalent. It's a new era that we're moving into, a new world or a new component of this pandemic. What are we going to do to adapt? We've done a great job as a state in the rollout of vaccinations. I'm, I'm proud of the state and they, they've led the nation in that. That's a, that's a big plus. But now, Scott, now you're facing this concern of is the Johnson Johnson vaccine safe? You know, they've stopped giving out the Johnson & Johnson. We, we, we know we've got thousands of vaccines sitting here in San Juan County that are looking for arms uh, to get into because we want to get to herd immunity. You know, I, I, I understand that there's some divisiveness in whether we should or shouldn't, people should or shouldn't be getting vaccines. I don't think it should be mandatory. But by all means, if you're in a position where your health is going to be compromised by this and you're a part of that larger statistical area or that group, then you got to do something about it. And I, and I think generally speaking, and I'd like to find out more information in regards to what percentage of individuals who are 65 and older or people with underlying health conditions, what percentage of that population has been vaccinated, because I think that might be one of the primary focuses of any update to the gating criteria. Right. I, I would agree. And um, so we know that you don't get any information prior to governor announcements, but do we know, right. can we anticipate when, when will the governor be speaking again is it going to be this week next week what do you what do you think uh, it won't be this week it'll be is it, i would think the earliest would be next week but i'm not i'm not counting on that either well, well i it's uh, it's all up in the air uh like i said disgrace told me in my first email to him monday of last week that it was going to be a two to four week period before they would get um before they would have something updated after after my email went out to him last week and 
some public pressure, I think, being pushed from other areas. My hope is that that, that gets expedited to the two-week period. But, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. I, I just I have to think that there's going to be, you know, that they have to be working on it because understanding the elements that are affecting human beings, affecting the businesses, affecting, you know, kids in school, all these different things that are a component of their, of their policies. And that's one of the dangerous things that is, has been on my mind through this whole process is these are, these are government policies, and every state has taken a different approach to what government policies are going to manage human beings and throughout this pandemic. And for right or for wrong, you know, it's neither here nor there, but, but you, have to, you have to start looking a little bit deeper as opposed to just 8 per 100,000 cases positive or a 5% positivity rate. You've got to start looking deeper at this in order to, uh, to kind of ebb the tide or, or stop the undulation of, of going back and forth from open to close, open to close. Right. Well, before I let you, you go, Mayor of the Mesa, Mr. Mayor, can you uh, just give us one of your inspiring speeches? What do you What do you have to say to the the town of Farmington to help keep us well, going here? You know, it comes back to the very basic things of what we can and can't control. And I, you know, I, I drive myself crazy focusing on things that I can't control, things that I want to control. You know, those <laughs> those are the things that give me, you know, lack of sleep at night. So just encouraging people to focus on what they can do. And each and every day we've got an opportunity to make a positive difference in other people's lives. And that's always going to be my, mo my motto and my mantra. Go out and make someone's day. And when you make someone else's day, it, guess what? It makes your day brighter. And, and, it, and regardless of other circumstances that may be going on, uh, service to others always makes the day better. So that's my encouraging word for the day, Rock and Rev. Thank you. I, I was looking forward to that. I knew you were going to end on something like that. And uh, Nate Duckett, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. As always, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here with you guys. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Talk to we, you later. We appreciate that, Mayor Nate Duckett, of course, from the city of Farmington. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we do know that there'll be an update to the map next Wednesday. Okay. And so I would assume that that may be, you know, if we haven't heard anything by then, we will definitely hear something or at least a press release, as the mayor said, um, on Wednesday when they update the map for whatever and whatever that is. Okay. If we stay in yellow or move up, move back to red, who who knows at this point? But we'll see the cases here in just a moment. So so there you go. But we always appreciate the mayor and uh, the mayor coming on to talk a little bit about uh, his, his concerns. And um, I think his concerns mirror many concerns from mayors all across the uh, state and as he mentioned you know Bernalillo County the largest populated county in our state has never moved out of the yellow um, category right. even when we were in turquoise um, Albuquerque was still yellow right their restaurants or businesses all of that so there, right. there is that and I'm sure there's a lot of frustrated people down there too and from the state side I'm sure they have a lot of reasons why they decide what they decide and we've reached out to them um, actually to get folks on the program. Um, the Department of Health has come on last few weeks. We appreciate that. Um, we've asked for Dr. Scrace or someone from his office um, to come on, and, and that hasn't happened yet, but we'll keep asking. So yeah. just to let everyone know, but we appreciate um, whenever the folks from Santa Fe can make some time for us, we always appreciate being able to ask them some questions because we think we have maybe different questions than they would be asked from the statewide media. That's, yes. So. A little more specific to our area. Indeed, exactly. Mm -hmm. So anyway, as we continue on, again, uh, New Mexico has moved into phase two of the vaccine. Um, you know, way ahead of schedule, as we've been hearing, of course, uh, the state has done a great job in rolling out the vaccine. And so we'll talk more a little bit about that with our next guest in just a moment. But, um, you know, now we are at phase two. Um, they are working to make sure that anyone in the earlier phases that wants a vaccine can get it. And so, you know, that would be, you know, folks that are 75 and older, now 65 and older, healthcare officials, healthcare workers, all those folks. Right. So that's where we are. Um, we did want to make a comment, and there was a, actually one of our viewers was commenting as well. This is the public vaccine dashboard from the state that's updated, um, I believe, daily almost, or every week at least, right, uh, showing the numbers of, of counties, the folks in the counties that have gotten a vaccine, at least one shot or both shots. And so that is another um, public information dashboard that the state has put together. As you can see, San Juan County is not the darkest green, but we are certainly um, in the green. And as we move forward, we can kind of see that at least 41, I'm sorry, 42 percent 
of our residents have at least one vaccine. 32.3% of our residents are fully vaccinated, and 26% of San Juan County residents have registered for the vaccine at the uh, state website. So they are sharing that information as well. Great. So there you go. Our next guest. Let's go to the phone. As we talk about vaccines, our next guest is uh, on the phone this morning, Ali Rye from the uh, San Juan County Office of Emergency Management. Good morning. Thank you for being on the program this morning. Good morning, Scott and Megan. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Just staying busy. I, <laughs> I bet. can imagine, yeah. <laughs> I don't know when you folks get a break over there because it's always one emergency after another, it seems. And so. Uh, <laughs> God bless you. We appreciate we appreci appreciate all of you over there that, that do the work. So um, I know um, we wanted you to come on, Allie, to talk a little bit about the vaccine rollout. We've just been talking about kind of the, the state's map that shows um, the population percentages in San Juan County that have at least one shot and, and the percentages that have fully vaccinated. And so I know you're working with the Department of Health to uh, get the vaccines into as many arms as, as you can, correct? Yes, sir. So... Not only are we working with the Department of Health, but we're working with quite a few, um, you know, private partners, including like PMS and Pena Family and Care Drug. Um, you know, we're really trying to get this vaccine out to, to anybody and everybody that, that wants to be able to get this vaccine. Great. And so, you know, big news of the past week, Johnson & Johnson. The uh, <laughs> six cases of blood clots, all, all women. Um, anyway, it's kind of controversial because that really mirrors the, the normal number of blood uh, clots that appear in the general public. But anyway, all of that aside. Out of millions of vaccines. Out <laughs> of oh, millions and millions. Yeah, just to it's, be clear. I mean, we don't necessarily have to go into the controversial science of all that, but we would like to hear how is this impacting the vaccine rollout? Um, we know that there were one and done clinics, they were calling them, because Johnson & Johnson was one vaccine and done. So is this impacting the amount of people that were able to vaccinate, or do we have enough Moderna and Pfizer vaccines to cover that gap? What's going on there? So Megan, yeah, like you said, so right now it's uh, six in six million have gotten um, this blood clot issue that's going on. Um, I, I do also want to kind of clarify, too, that, you know, for the state of New Mexico, we've only given out around 3% of this Johnson & Johnson shot. So, um, yes, that, it, that is a decent number of, sh of shots getting, getting given out, but, um, you know, it's not near as many as our Moderna and Pfizer. Um, to answer your question, though, about, uh, you know, do we have enough vaccine, we have, we have the vaccine here. We have plenty of vaccine um, to go around for those who want to get vac vaccinated. Um, we have definitely switched over for our shot clinics that were scheduled to be um, just Johnson & Johnson. Those have officially are still going on, but they've just flipped over to either a Pfizer or a Moderna. Um, we, you know, we don't foresee this impacting us at, at least right now to any, to any, um, you know, great issue. Uh, we, we have the vaccine to cover those, those areas. Very good. And, uh, and, and so with that, then you're still pretty confident that anyone, again, the state has kind of opened up the vaccines to anyone over 16 that would like to get one, um, should be able to then get a, get an appointment, um, within the next few weeks, you think? Oh, yeah, most definitely. So, um, you know, in the past, we've been pushing that pre-registration at the vaccinenm.org, and that's still up. The portal is still working, but um, we are also um, accepting walk-ins at most of these clinics. So if people get there and, they, and you know, you decide you're, you're rolling through town and you see a shot clinic going on and you want a shot, you know, we have the, the capability of being able to give folks shots even if they aren't registered. So we, you know, everything that is, is capable and able to, to want a shot and get a shot is, is definitely being able to get, get one right now. And uh, I know we still have vaccine hesitancy around uh, around these parts. So can, can I think you, around the country. I think, I think around the world. Around, yeah, yeah. There's vaccine hesitancy. But yeah. what would you say to those folks? Um, I think the biggest thing for that is to kind of look into your community. So, and even statewide, you know, we are sitting at, you know, a little under 40% right now for the, you know, well, we're sitting at um, at least 
43% for those in this county who have gotten one shot, you know, and 33 for those who have received fully vaccinated, myself being one of those, you know, and I've been vaccinated since December, um, as well as many in my office. And, and we're just not, because I know the hesitancy is, you know, um, that something bad could possibly happen from receiving this vaccine. And um, we're just not seeing it where it, the, the numbers that we're seeing, you know, 25 million of people are dying of COVID. We're not seeing those numbers pop up with the vaccine. Um, so I, I really think that they should speak to the community, speak to those people that have gotten a vaccine, um, you know, ask, you know, what, what kind of side effects did you have, if any? Um, because, you know, uh, when you get the flu shot, you know, your arm is just a little sore. And that's about all that we're seeing coming out of people getting these shots is just a little bit of tenderness in the arm and then, you know, you're getting to go on with your daily duties. And uh, I think the big thing to remember is, you know, the more people that we get vaccinated, you know, the possibility of going, you know, from yellow to hopefully green to, to turquoise to opening back up. I know that our community is, is tired and exhausted of COVID, but we have to realize that it's still here. And uh, if we want to get to those stages of getting back to some kind of normalcy, that, that this is this is it. This is how we're getting there. Right. And I think that's kind of my philosophy, too, Ali Rye, about, you know, if you want to do something we can, that we can do to try to get things open back up and get kids back to school and get restaurants back open and, and doing all these things that, we, that we've missed doing over the last 57 weeks, um, you know, getting the vaccine is, is one way, one small way that each of us can kind of help us get back to that, uh, that normalcy, if you will, and, uh, and to help in that regard and, and achieve that herd immunity, which, uh, as we can see, we're not, we're, if we need 80%, we're not near that. And uh, that's going to take a little bit of time to, to get there, right? Correct. It is. You know, honestly, though, Scott, I, I think that I really want to, you know, commend San Juan County for um, the efforts that they've been doing to get vaccinated. I mean, we are busting this vaccine out. People are coming out in droves, and not only here, but even, you know, at our clinics at, with IHS and, and Shiprock and on Navajo Nation, you know, um, we, are, we are getting vaccines into arms. I mean, we would love to get more vaccines into arms, but San Juan County, I think, is definitely doing their job. Um, we just, we have to work a little bit harder is all it is. I, but I definitely believe we are, you know, above that timeline that even the state possibly has set for all of us. I agree, and I appreciate you saying that because that's very important. And I think the kudos to, uh, again, the work of folks in your office and, as you mentioned, the other um, private pharmacies that you're working with, the Department of Health, to, again, put in the long hours um, to, to get these vaccines out to people throughout our county. It's not just in the, in the three, four cities that, that we talk about a lot of times, but in some of the rural areas as well. So that's important to note as well. Ali Rye, thanks so much for joining us today. No problem, guys. Y'all have a good day. You All too. All right, Ali, thank you very much. Very good. And so there's the update from the Office of Emergency Management. O-E-M. O-M-G. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> O-M-G, it's O-E-M. There you go. That could be I'm good. I'm sure they've never heard that I'm before. I'm sure they would love that marketing campaign. Yeah, there you go. But anyway, so. But great news. I was yeah. I was worried that the J&J &J snafu was going to sort of set us back here. But so far, they're saying no. It sounds like it has. Sounds like it hasn't. Right. We're going to keep trucking along. Well, and I think the, the terminology they're using, you know, like they're they're pausing it, right? They haven't canceled it. They haven't stopped you know, they're just pausing it. So I'm, I'm hoping that maybe it will come back. But, but certainly I know folks are concerned. Um, you know, anything that, that is a concern for your health of getting a vaccine, people get concerned about. And so until they can link it or know more about it or why these women are suffering these, these blood clots, you know, if it's vaccine related or something else related, who, you know, that's I think what a lot of people are trying to figure out. Yeah, and get well, that information out there. As I was telling you off mic, you know, certain birth control medicine can also lead to blood clots, and so I think it's notable that these are all women right. that have had these problems. I just, I don't know. Right. I'm, I'm not. Yeah. Anyway. It's a question for the it's, doctors. It's a question for when the When we doc. talk to them again, so yeah. we'll add that to the list yes. of many questions that we have for Always the doctors. For the doc. Many, indeed. So there you go. All right. As. Uh, Ali Rye was saying, again, uh, as folks were registering at vaccinenm.org, that is the place to go. But there are, again, a lot of uh, private pharmacies and things like that that are 
offering vaccines even without registration, but we always like to pass along the numbers. Um, if you do want to register or having trouble registering or don't have access to the internet to register, again, radio audience 855 600 3453 is the number that you can call to get help for registration with the state of New Mexico. Um, we did want to remind everyone that Care Drug, one of the uh, private pharmacies that uh, have been mentioned this morning, is offering their last vaccine drive through clinic happening on Saturday. Um, and again, they were going to, that was going to be one of the Johnson and Johnsons, but they're not offering that obviously so they are offering just the second dose of the moderna vaccine so these are for folks who got the first dose um earlier from care drug to come back and make sure they get the second um dose but they are still offering registrations through their website for folks who live in the bloomfield and aztec areas to get the vaccine from their supplies great so i think that's important for folks in the aztec Bloomfield Blanco areas, which is kind of where Care, care Drug is. Mm -hmm. And so, but this is happening again Saturday, 9 a.m. till noon for the second dose of Moderna um, over in Aztec. That is 18, sorry, 1600 Lydia Rippey Road, Aztec. So there you go. We want to talk about the watch list because we've had a lot more yeah, additions yeah. to the uh, COVID watch list. Again, this is the uh, New Mexico Environment Department, right? So if you have a rapid response, which doesn't mean necessarily just a case, but it means you have maybe a cluster of cases, they will go in and investigate and, uh, and get the word out and try to do the contact tracing and uh, notify folks. And so um, Hillcorp is on the watch list from uh, their facility in Aztec with uh, two Rapid responses, Domino's in Bloomfield on West Broadway with two. The Chili Pod, as we mentioned last week. Uh, Country Club Elementary in Farmington with two. Esperanza Elementary in Farmington has two. Northeast Elementary in Farmington with two rapid responses. Kirtland Middle School in Kirtland with two. And Nijoni Elementary School in Shiprock with two rapid responses. Okay. Nothing has been, no one has been shut down. So we can certainly say that. And again, this is updated daily um, at the Environment Department's uh, website. So we share this with you every week uh, when there are local uh, rapid responses to tell you about. So, But that has caused some issues with our schools. And so there's a story in the newspaper just this morning about the eight schools that are closing to in-person learning because of a prevalence of COVID-positive cases. And we just talked to Kirk Carpenter last hour on my radio program about Park Avenue Elementary School in Aztec. They are going to be shut down from the 14th through the 19th um, because of a case over there that they discovered uh, yesterday. Just as school was starting, by the way. Yeah, of course. And then in the Bloomfield, they now have Mesa Alta uh, Central Primary, Bloomfield High School, and Charlie Y. Brown High School are going to be closed now uh, to in-person learning. Again, virtual will continue. So, um, so sorry, students, you can't get out of Going to class. No. No. Keep doing your work. That's right. Exactly. And at Central Consolidated, as we saw from the watch list, Nijoni Elementary, uh, Kirtland Elementary, and Kirtland Middle Schools are closed to uh, in-person learning again in that district, but the virtual learning is going to continue. But those are the impacts that we have seen. So, and as Mr. Carpenter mentioned, this is, you know, these schools are following the plans that they have in place for a positive case, and that's what what you need to do, and depending on the impact, the the contact right. of whoever was um, infected, uh, that determines just how big of a closure you need to have, or right. how many other people are impacted. Right. So, so there you go. All right, moving on. Moving on. Okay. How about some Johns Hopkins numbers? Yes, here we go. So the United States confirmed cases are now at 31,423,436. United States confirmed deaths are now at 564,387. There you go. And as we can see, we kind of look at that, that graph in the bottom right-hand corner that I always look at, right, as we saw the peaks and the, and the valleys a little bit, and the, it's kind of evening off, but that number, that, you know, the, the, the rate is still pretty high. The numbers of cases per day is still, um, I think, higher than the experts would like it to be. Mm -hmm. um, if we're really not, if we're really getting out of this. And so, I mean, it's, it's still kind of hovering around that 60,000 cases a day, and that's not low enough, I think, to really say that we've come, come out of this and not getting ready for the next surge right. is a concern. Right. So that's what we're looking at on there. 
Very good. In New Mexico, again, yesterday, 222 new cases. We're at 194,378 over the last several weeks. San Juan County had 25 in one day. That's a lot. We haven't seen that type of a number in, uh, in a while. So we're now at over 14,000 cases in San Juan County. There were eight deaths in New Mexico, so we're approaching 4,000 souls lost. One of those was in San Juan County for a total now of 463 deaths from COVID-19. And there were another 140 recoveries yesterday, which I think is notable. Yeah. And so we've kind of seen that number come down too. I guess as the cases have come down, it would make sense that the recoveries would come down. That is true. So shouldn't be surprised that those numbers are yeah. smaller as well. But, but there you go. The news stories, of course, here's the New Mexico statistics. Again, ksje.com. We are keeping track of all of that. The Navajo Nation, again, they had 10 additional cases yesterday for a total now of 30,279. Notable on the Navajo Nation, though, is they had no new deaths. That's yesterday, and that is the same as since, I believe, Sunday. There have been no deaths from COVID-19 on the reservation for several days in a row. Yeah. So we celebrate that and are grateful for that. So that's, that's a what's big going success on there. story. Definitely. Well, yeah. and you know, a year ago, can you, do you remember? I and, do. I, right. Of course. Right. Yeah. That you know, was, I mean, national we were, news about all the heartache that was going on over there. And they had a, I mean, the New York Times had a story just two weeks ago. You shared it with me. The Navajo Nation Trying success. to get me to read. I appreciate that. I was trying to get you to read. I don't know if you actually read it. But, I looked at the pictures. Mm hmm. Great story about the turnaround is what you're you're getting yeah. at. Yeah, right. About the, and, the Navajo Nation. And sort of tracing, I mean, a lot of it had to do with federal relief that was funneled into to the Navajo Nation. Definitely. A lot of it had to do with just um, the fealty that you have at the Navajo Nation. So this the spirit of all working together, the spirit of everybody doing their part. Um, and then a lot of it had to do with just how seriously they took it with the curfews and uh, other protective measures. So... Right. It's a big success story. Big Definitely. turnaround. Very much so. Very much so. All right. Um, we have a couple more things to mention, and those are some food box distributions from, again, the uh, Echo Food Bank. They're going to be out again at Blanco Elementary on uh, April 22nd. That's next week, beginning at 4 p.m. at Blanco Elementary School. So we always like to share information about that. Um, you can find out more, of course, at the Echo Food Bank website and their Facebook page. And then Nagizi Chapter House is having a food box distribution and that is happening again next Thursday, April 22nd uh, at the uh, Nagizi Chapter House. So there is that as well. Yep. Are we ready for our third guest? Let's do it. Our third guest this morning here on KSJE. Here we go. Joining us this morning to talk a little bit about visiting um, policies at assisted living centers in Farmington. Ty Tapaha is here. She is executive director of the Bridge at Farmington. And uh, Ty, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good to have you with us, and uh, we wanted to kind of bring you on to talk a little bit about how maybe things have changed, hopefully for the better, at uh, the bridge. And I guess just to get us started, give us an idea of of the population at the bridge. How many residents do you have these days? Well, here at our assisted living community, we have about, I'm going to say about 40, 45 residents um, in the community, um, and we you know, have a 62 apartment um, community, so we're about 50 percent. I got gotcha. you. Very good. And so give us some idea at the beginning, of course, a year ago, um, everything was shut down and the policies that you put in place to, uh, to protect your, your residents. I know there, was a con there were concerns, of course, as staff was coming in and in some, uh, some facilities, not yours, um, there were definitely a lot of cases being, being reported. And so can you kind of take us back to a year ago and, and set the stage as to what was being done to try to, uh, again, keep everybody as safe as possible? we heard about, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we did uh, prepare for, you know, th wh whatever was to come. Um, we weren't sure about anything, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, we did take caution and, um, you know, visitation restrictions were put in place. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't, um, of course, it was to protect our residents um, in our facility. Um, right. Yeah, and um, so 
so we we really just um, began our sanitation protocol. You know, having a strong infection and prevention um, infection prevention and control um, you know protocol in place. Our program is critical in protecting the residents. So you know, making sure that we had that in place was was a priority um, for our residents. Um, so we maintain that throughout the throughout the year. Um, just making sure that um, our staff were educated, our residents were educated, our families were educated. Um, I felt like that's where it began, um, and you know, it was it was difficult for our residents, of course, because they weren't allowed to, you know, um, see their families, um, you know, in person. Of course, um, they weren't really allowed to go out. Uh, just about that time, things started closing. Um, you know, doctors' offices had different um, protocols in place, so it was very limited for them, uh, very difficult. But we really tried to maintain, um, you know, their health and safety was always, you know, something that we um, tried to to protect. Very good. And speaking of protecting, let's talk about vaccinations. There was a priority placed on folks living in congregational settings, which would be skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities. Um, have your folks been vaccinated? Yes, I am very proud to say 100% of our residents have been vaccinated. 80% um, of our staff have been vaccinated and we are still educating um, and encouraging our staff and, you know, family members, those, um, you know, who have loved ones here at the community to become vaccinated as well. So. Um, I felt like, you know, I, I'm very proud of that. Indeed. And so is that and then allowed you um, as the administrator at the bridge executive director to maybe change some of your policies about visitation and, and things like that for your residents who have now been vaccinated? Um, it does change some things, uh, but we still follow any of the guidance, you know, CMS, CDC, our company guidelines. We still follow those guidelines because, you know, um, those restrictions that we put in place, again, protect our residents, um, and they are our number one priority when it comes to that because, you know, they are still at um, high risk of being infected by any respiratory pathogens, including, you know, the coronavirus. So, um, but um, we are, you know, able to have a outdoor in-person visitations. We do have indoor if, if the weather, um, you know, is bad. But the outdoor in-person visitations allow residents who are vaccinated and, you know, families to have physical contact, um, you know, to ha be able to have that visitation and spend time together. Um, you know, residents are um, able to visit with their families outside of the facility. Um, they're still, you know, they're able to go to doctor's appointments, um, you know, without, without any of those restrictions. So I feel like that's been, been such a, a blessing for all of us that they're able to do those things now. Very good. And so is it how many people are allowed to visit at one time? Is it just, um, you know, some facilities have like it's one person per day and you can't switch people like in the middle of the day, I mean, what what what's going on there? So with our visitation at our community, um, it, of course, it's going to be different from any other community in the area. Um, in our community, um, we do allow uh, two-person visits. Um, they can schedule however many visits within the day, depending on um, you know what we have scheduled. Usually, it's just one visit, but. You know, if, if there were um, additional um, spots available for them, we, you know, they, they could schedule a second. But um, two persons per visit, um, and, you know, they're, again, they're allowed to have physical contact. They can go on a walk with their family. Um, they could bring lunch and have, you know, a meal right outside in the designated visiting area. Very good. And that sounds like a big change from, you know, some of the images we saw earlier on over the past 12 months of, you know, folks sitting on either side of a plate glass window from each other and being able to visit that way or, you know, those types of restrictions, which we certainly understand the reasons behind them. But uh, for you and your staff, was, was there any difficulties trying to explain to your residents just maybe why they couldn't 
hug their grandkids for a while or, or why those, those precautions needed to be put in place? Yes, we did have some difficulty at the beginning. It did become a little bit overwhelming toward the end of the year, but um, once they, you know, we were able to speak with them, educate them on, you know, this is what's going on in, in the world today, you know, this is what is going on in the area um, with the positivity rates, um, the increased cases, things like that, we were able to, to, to talk with them about that um, and reasons why, you know, they couldn't visit with families or in person or their, um, you know, grandchildren. Um, you know, they, they were, they did understand. So when the, it came time for them to get the vaccine, I think that's why they were all on board. Um, everybody was on board. Families were on board. Um, I can't believe how unbelievable unbelievably um, supportive the families have been through this entire time. So, um, but our residents understood and, you know, that's why it, it, it was, I think it was really easy for them to, to um, agree to getting the vaccine. Right. Well, certainly if it gets you to be able to hug a grandkid, I think that would be an easy sell for that population. But Ty, we're just about out of time, but we, I wanted to share with our audiences the video that uh, the bridge produced. Um, I think as your residents were getting vaccinated or after they were getting vaccinated because they were really uh, seemed pretty excited about it. So I'm going to share that with everybody and then, uh, and then we'll say goodbye to you in just a moment. But I want to share that video right now here on KSJE. Okay, great. Wednesday morning here on KSJE. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. You bet. Great to talk to you. That's Ty Tapaha, Executive Director of The Bridge at Farmington. And we're back here in the studio, and we appreciate um, Ty's involvement in the show today and sharing of that information, and uh, we love the dancers. Oh, my gosh. That video. Right? When I first saw it, I got a little teary-eyed. When Did I you? Said, well, yeah, and when I yeah. just saw it now, I was like, I'm still, my heart is warmed. It's great, right? It's so heartwarming. Well, and again, the I fact that, uh, you know, the, we've seen so many pictures, like I said, of the, you know, grandkids, you know, visiting grandparents between the glass, you know, and holding up a hand to a glass yeah, window. Yeah, exactly. To, and, you know, that that is hopefully close to being ending across the country. It's abating, yeah. For folks, um, it's got to be a great thing, so... It's awesome. We celebrate that. Well, and even the residents, I mean, being able to share a meal next to each other right. for a long time, that wasn't even happening. So it's not even, it wasn't even just visitors from the outside. It was the folks that they're used to hanging out with on the inside. And that's, yeah, that takes a Yeah, eating in your toll. room and that staying in your room. Yeah. Ex exactly. Awful. So. So we celebrate that, yeah, and we're grateful. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, that is our show for this week, everybody. We certainly appreciate all of you for uh, tuning in and being with us every week. We're going to stay here as long as we need to stay here and, and share information. And so as we uh, move through this, so please continue to share the program with your social networks and uh, let folks know they can join us every Thursday morning at 9, live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, on the radio at 5.06 p.m. and at noon on KNMI. But until next week, Stay well, everybody, and we'll see you right here on KSJE.